Welcome to what turned out to be our second session um, in the Cleveland Teaching Collaborative Summer Sandbox. And thank you to Ty's Hoist, who's here to talk about the post-pandemic teaching community. Um, Ty's teaches in the physics department at CSU, and we're really excited to have him give an overview of what the teachers in his group have been up to over the summer and the goals of having a community for educators to kind of hash out pandemic experiences and then what will eventually be our experiences going forward. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. You can, you should now be able to see my big head, right? Um, so I thought for a moment it would be fun to start with. Remember uh, back in 20. 19, this is roughly what a classroom looks like. Um, so to me, um, this, uh, when, when I saw this together with Jan last week, actually, this looks kind of scary to me to sit together again, or let the students make the students sit together and do work together. And I, I'll, I'll have to get used to that. And it's definitely a good idea. It's, at least it's, for me, it feels great to be on campus right now to get used and to ease into that mode again. But I'm also very cognizant of the fact that that's not gonna be um, a luxury that everybody has and definitely not all the students will have. So that's, that's something we're gonna have to deal with, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, we have our learning community and let's see if I can, um, how much I can get rid of. Um, yeah, good enough. We have our learning community that we started, basically Sean Ryan in the math department and I started that, uh, pitched that idea to um, uh, uh, Shelly and Molly in, what was it, March or so, we got a bunch of people together. Um, and we started just thinking about, okay, what have we learned in the, uh, in the past 12, 14, 16 months? And what do we want to, how do we want to come out of all of this? Um, we have Melanie, Aaron, and Alina were very, um, um, very um, graceful in keeping notes and um, uh, being co-hosts during our first session. We have something like 25 uh, people. And the idea was, the original idea at least, and I think we're gonna mostly stick to that, is to have in principle four meetings, four formal meetings in our um, community with 25 faculty. We ended up with um, two sessions, at least in May, where we were really trying to reflect, okay, what's, how was teaching going in the past year? What went well? What went wrong? What do we want to improve? What do we want to keep on doing in the um, in, in the next year that we've learned here? And then in August and further on from there, we're gonna zoom in and make it more um, particular, more practical, and start looking at okay, um, how specifically are you gonna implement stuff? What are you going to uh, bring back to the next year? At, you know, what's the one change? And then, of course, in October, we're going to talk about everything that's going wrong so far and how can we help each other to, uh, you know, tweak here and there. And then with December, we have reflection and outlook. Now, it ha so happened to be that in, um, um, in July, yeah? No, in, in, in late June, I think. I um, attended a small workshop by um, Kate, Denial, uh, Kate Denial, who is at Knox, I think. Um, yep. And um, so that was a reflective workshop on the past year as well, which because, you know, our workshop, our uh, community is hosted by a mathematician and a physicist, was very practical. That workshop was much more inward much more reflective how are you feeling and that turned to, turned out to be at least for me as least as valuable to have a look at okay how are we all doing what's you know what's the emotional part of it because um um there's a lot going on and we shouldn't we should make sure that we're not completely burned out um already if not uh mid-september with four more four more months to go so um, having said that, um, I'm just, what I have here is nothing super profound. 
Um, and I think it's a good idea to have as much of a discussion throughout the presentation as we can. Um, um, with the notion that, of course, I cannot see the chat at the moment. So um, because I only have one screen, which is one thing that's annoying about Zoom teaching um, uh, in the classroom that I need to fix. But OK, so we went through a bunch of questions and um, I'll have here the summary of what we what we discussed, what we found um, as a community. Uh, so I trust Shelley or Molly or somebody else to uh, shout questions at me whenever appropriate. Um, so things we learned was a lot about how students live, right? And who students are and that they're not uh, brains on sticks in a classroom, just like we're not brains on sticks who show up for class and then live in the closet for the summer semester. Um, all those commitments that they had at particular last year, but also in general, all these things that can go wrong, will go wrong. It's not because students are lazy, basically, but it's because there are uh, there are real other problems going on, uh, real other issues going on in their lives. And that's, I think, a key part where we want to, uh, that came up, uh, the be kind words came up a couple of times um, in all of the talks, all of the discussions, right? Assume goodwill. And that's, I think, something that's, um, that is, uh, that was very much the most successful teaching that I saw last semester were people who were able to really keep on assuming goodwill and being flexible with uh, due dates and um, uh, being kind and understanding and making, uh, putting e um, equity above equality, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, there was a lot of cheating and nobody really had a good way out of uh, how to do any kind of assessments that are scalable to larger classes. Uh, there were um, at least one, um, Steve Gupkin in math was uh, super enthusiastic about um, specs-based grading and um, making students come up with their own metrics and just, okay, these are the levels that you need to get to and make it some kind of agreement and get the teacher out of the way of all the learning. That's great, but he also immediately admitted that that's going to be very hard to do in a larger scale class. Um, um, and another math teacher I'm thinking, um, uh, Felipe Martins uh, basically said that, yeah, because of this very rigid, this is what you have to do, this is what you, this very rigid um, content that's dictated from above, basically led it, he didn't want to teach any um calculus intro courses because there's so much material to cover and that's probably a realization that's still true outside of the um pandemic teaching you know uh, pandemic teaching got harder um it's harder to cover all the material but it's still very hard to cover we're probably still in putting an information overload on our students um, and going a little bit slower doesn't hurt um if we're allowed to so yeah um, I, if it's appropriate you said to call out if um a moment occurs the screen we're looking at i really think is important to just pause and i put this in the chat and i love that you said they weren't necessarily surprising or i'm going to stop my video my internet's a little slow but i'd love to hear comments i mean they just some of the yeah. things seem really technical like and manageable to really tend to moving forward. But some like the overwhelming, you know, realization of all of the demands on students, the care team referrals, um, even the preparation for courses, which feels like a holistic understanding of where students are. I don't yeah. know if it makes sense to talk about any other participants' reactions to this list or comments yes, about, yeah. Because in the end, this needs to be a discussion, right? Uh, somewhere on one of the next slides, I have that comment as well. Let's keep on discussing and let's keep on learning about learning and learning about teaching as much as possible.
I also think that a lot of what we're what we're seeing directly ties into um, equity gaps and equity in general um, uh, along racial lines, along gender lines, or across uh, um, along disabilities, whatever. All of these all of these gaps become very have become to me at least very much more tangible. Um, and poverty, um, and 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 just simply the act of thinking about what to do there, um, instead of uh, treating an entire class of uh, well, sixty people or however many can fit in this as one holistic blob of you know brains where we pour knowledge in. That, that, that's a that's a key realization that if that wasn't already there for me that 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 got ingrained i think this is just a really important point if i can jump in for a second because molly and i have thought about this a lot in our work with the collaborative the the issues that the the idea that our classrooms and all our students are the same, or you know, we can treat them as the same, is it's deeply flawed. And the pandemic really brought that out. And what I love about this moment is that we're here talking to you, Ties, from across colleges for one of the first times, and not just passing after class in the hallway, um, and yeah. having a conversation about what this means across disciplines, um, because I think it really is really important. In my history courses, I've really scaled back and focused on skills. But when it comes to teaching future social studies teachers, I have to make sure they have certain content. So I understand the tensions that you're talking about. Um, and I feel like those tensions are really front and center between content and care in the sciences too, right? No, definitely in the sciences, especially thanks to transfer agreements. But um, I mean, at the fear of going too much off script, but um, how much content do, um, do students really need to know as history teachers? I mean, knowing that Columbus sailed in this direction, in that, uh, that he was a named Columbus, that he sailed in this direction and it was in somewhere in the late 1400s. I can look that up. I've got Wikipedia for that. But what I want to get out of a college level history class is the, you know, the skill set of thinking about that critically examining a text and uh, and thinking about it. Just like I really don't care in a physics class if a student has the correct answer of the velocity of a block going down a ramp. Nobody's going to ever use that in their life again. Right, but what I do want to, it's a nice contained problem in the end where they're, they can contain their thinking and structure their thinking about and doing, doing some quantitative analysis about a fair, yeah, about a, um, a structure in the real world. So I would even challenge right now all the content that we think is necessary for whatever career, let's have that discussion. Yeah, no, and, and I, I didn't wanna to assume too much about the sciences, <laughs> not oh. being a scientist, but for history, it's exactly like you said, we're teaching them the skills, the historical thinking. When you see something on the internet, do you do the vertical reading? Do you look who wrote it, when it was written, who's the audience, what site is it hosted on? Um, Mandy Goodset just gave us a nice session yeah. on Monday about this, and those are the skills. They can look anything up um, wherever, and we can show them good venues for that, right? Like you just said, but um, having those critical thinking skills, that's what they need to walk away with. And even in high school, Will, I saw your comment about seeing that tension as well, but um, it's what do students need to walk away with? They need to walk away with that information literacy, right? That critical thinking. Right. Um, now that's not to say that that makes a course, I mean, paring down a course in terms of content, um, while doubling down on, on critical thinking or on, on skills development, that doesn't make a course easier. Um, that doesn't, you know, that, then the cognitive load is still, uh, can still be unlimited, basically. 
if, if not higher, because plugging and chugging a couple of equations, everybody can um, really understand the physics behind it is, hard, is a lot harder and only comes after a little bit of content knowledge. Um, anything else here? What's in the chat? Um, oh, thanks for the for pausing. Didn't want to get you off, but I was... no, no, no. I, 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 pretty much any presentation I ever give starts with saying, um, um, if I don't get past slide three, I consider this presentation a success. Um, so yeah, th this is basically what we got, what we learned about our students and um, uh, things that worked well, mostly uh, the, the type of discussions, what kind of pedagogical approaches. And we really try to split the pedagogical approaches from the technical solution there and what, um, um, but there is some overlap inevitably here as well. And what do you wanna bring back in the fall? where um, office hours were actually very much a mixed bag. It's really hard for some people, it was really hard for in, including for me to get people into office hours. Uh, I had some luck with just um, uh, reaching out to them uh, kind of quasi during lectures in private chat or so, but formal office hours were usually quiet. Um, but some other people had uh, more people in Zoom office hours than they'd ever had in their uh, office on the 27th floor of Rhodes Tower, which, you know, makes sense because of elevators. Um, uh, so keeping Zoom type office hours seems like a very simple hack to keep um, things more inclusive, more accessible and less time consuming for everybody, basically. Um, so yeah, I've got now a, uh, in my signature also a direct Zoom link. I may after uh, after Shelley's uh, presentation make that into a Teams link if I can um, fix that um, and just be on Zoom for the entire day. Um, and yeah, you can see if I'm there, um, if I'm available for any homework questions. All the modern learning techniques uh, that we know from high school and occasionally from um, from hippies classes in history, uh, but that we rigorous scientists are clearly stuck in the 70s, where the, whether that's the 1870s or the 1770s is unclear. Um, but the flipped classroom, the universal uh, universal design for learning, the standard based grading, um, those kind of things that was magnified, that those kind of techniques were a lot more extra more efficient in in uh, in um, pandemic learning because flexibility is so key here um, because you know the the um, classes where I was actually lecturing that is copying from my one note to another a spare one note on screen while everybody was looking at me. Uh, on Zoom was so gracefully, gracelessly um, inefficient. So flipping a completely a complete classroom was a lot easier to do, a lot better to do clearly in um, in, in the past year online. Um, and recording lectures. Um, it was one thing that I really didn't realize how efficient lecture recording would be for re-watching it, for uh, alleviating the stress of, oh, I have to keep up with taking notes because otherwise I don't have the information that the instructor is spewing over us. That's all um, alleviated because you can always re-watch the lecture at twice the speed. Those are clearly also techniques that the students, I think, developed pretty quickly and taught us what the optimal way of using videos, instructional videos were. Um, and we need to make sure to keep on talking to students there to make sure that we know what is working well for them and particular subgroups, not just one or two students, but having, and this is what I'm making up right now, but having some kind of inviting comments, be it in the um, course evals or being be it somewhere else of hey what is working really well in terms of uh, educational techniques for you could be very useful 
Um, what didn't work? Well, cheating didn't work. No small talk just before class, after class, quickly checking in. Hey, how's it going? Good job with the homework yesterday. Um, either positive or negative. It, it was really hard to catch the students. Um, and nobody really had an uh, option, uh, a solution there. Same with cheating, um, especially, and that was part because there was so much stress for everyone. There was more cheating. It was a lot easier to cheat. Um, and it, there was nobody who found who came up with a clear technical solution. Hey, we can mitigate cheating by using lockdown browser. Um, and even if you could mitigate it, there were all kinds of issues there. Um, um, and then retention of knowledge. I And that's the part that I fear the most for, for the post-pandemic teaching, basically, what are we going to do next? Because I am going to assume that I basically, in my Physics 2 class, I have to rehash half of Physics 1 because students, I, I cannot assume, assume that people know all of calculus and all of physics one there. And that's going to take some adjustment. And that's going to stay for a couple of years because even the high school students, that, that, that's going to ripple down for quite a while. Um, many of these, I um, chatted about what are the technical implementations. Oh, one thing that's uh, I really want to think about now, actually, and 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 think about what to do uh, soon. But one thing that worked very well for me, for several of us actually was to do a pre-semester survey, uh, especially during the pandemic, saying not just getting information out of students, but also saying, "Hey, I know uh, I'm listening. I want to know who you are." and creating a kind of an atmosphere of let's talk to each other and I'm here for all of you. Um, and let's have this discussion that, that worked pretty well. So I want to keep that. Um, I That means that I have to come up with a survey pretty quickly and thinking about what kind of questions do I want to ask there. Some of the questions that I probably want to ask is, okay, if we're going to sit in this room with 50 people here, what, how does that make you feel? Um, I obviously, uh, statistically, 40% um, of your fellow students are not vaccinated. Maybe you're, some, maybe you're one of them. Maybe you don't want to be vaccinated. I'm not going to ask. But how are you going to keep about masking? What if we have students who say, yeah, sure, I'm vaccinated or I cannot be vaccinated, but I'm really scared to be on campus? What kind of accommodations? Can we, should we give them, and that's a discussion to have with the higher level um, uh, where admin should really come up with some kind of clear and kind policy there, I guess. Technically what worked well, yay, OneNote um, is doing all the homework assignments through some kind of electronic system for me. Um, that was students handed in their homework in OneNote. Sometimes if they had a tablet and a pen, they wrote it. Otherwise, they simply took a photo and handed it in. I could quickly grade it, so they got it back if I'm really on the ball on the same day, basically. And then later, I can automatically release to the students who had done their homework already, could release the solution set, my solution set, so that they can uh, compare that at least, meaning that I don't have to, for 50 people, it's just not feasible to give them full detailed feedback every week, but they at least can compare it with the official solution set and see what's going on there. Um, I hope we're going to keep on using more of the Blackboard or Teams features and keep that, um, keep at least the grades communicate that easy, easily. Um, yep. Okay, so what do we um, institutional support was a big one because definitely people felt uh, there was some lack there in that we got a lot of support in terms of the technical how to ramp up, how to do Zoom. But the theoretical of what can we expect of the students, are they, um, you know, what kind of accommodations should we give, is lockdown browser okay? Um, 
those kind of things, uh, what kind of text should we use instead of having a wild west and go to any tool known on the web or unknown on the web and build one yourself. Um, that kind of guidance uh, would be great to have a little bit more of that. Also, um, um, when coming back to campus, for those of us who will, uh, doing something that is smarter tech and make sure that all the tech is available in most of the classrooms is probably a more important need than going for super fancy classrooms, one or one or two super fancy classrooms, right? Um, there's plenty of stuff that we can upgrade still here. Um, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, blackboards that are slightly taller than than this because my my back starts hurting when it uh, when I have to scribble that low. Um, so round two, um, we're planning to do that. The next meeting we're planning to do in in August, probably the week or the, uh, two weeks before classes, in, somewhere in those final two weeks, um, and. Basically focusing on, okay, what particular things do you want to improve in your classes? What are you going to, you know, what is the issue? What are you scared about? What, what do you want to catch? And how are you going to do that? What kind of technical implementation? What kind of didactical implementation, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we also really want to uh, start with question zero. That really should be question zero is... And that comes back to Kate Denial's uh, workshop. Do you feel ready? How ready are you to be in the classroom again? Both because of there are 50 seats in this room at certainly not six feet apart, but also have you rested well? Are you ready to go on for 15 weeks? Because then the reflection probably should be if you're not ready, however you're feeling, there's a good chance that your students are feeling the same way. And that's the way we should assume that we need to treat each other without trying to sound too doom and gloom there. So we had a whole bunch of links, tools, and other things that um, people were happy to use and to share. I um, um, I've got them, um, copy pasted those links. Um, we got my favorites that I'm gonna use in all my classes and Shelly already knows, of course, that would be perusal um, for social reading. There are a bunch of others um, uh, here as well, um, including of course, the collaborative. And yeah, one thing that I got really out of out of this uh, also technically um, is that the sh just sit together for five minutes and write in a Google doc and do some silent editing of a Google doc was a really effective way of both getting good information on paper, but also getting your mindsets focused into a discussion. So I'd like to thank Shelly and Molly for introducing that to, to me and I might, keep using those kind of techniques in later classes. And most of all, let's keep on talking and let's keep up a culture of discussing and experimenting and moving forward in the classroom instead of, um, and not, let's not dig each other for that, especially in, in terms of tenure and all that, but let's see where we can improve in our teaching uh, and not strive for a bar of, fully competent or excellent or whatever you want to call it. And that's the bar we have to jump over. Let's keep on trying to get better and better because that was a really fun part of this year for me to keep on a really heavy, but really fun part was to keep on thinking about teaching. And we don't do that enough. So yeah, that's all I have. Wow. Guys, this is amazing to see in a coherent presentation Oh, was uh, coherent? <laughs> yes. I am so excited um, that the community happened. So thank you to you and Sean for initiating and that you, the reflective moment of looking over it for this presentation and, and for the collaborative. So 
Thank you very much Thank for being you. here. Um, and we do have, you know, a few more questions or comments. Let me stop sharing and um, yeah. Anything. Kalita, by the way, I did not mention you on the first slide, but thank you for helping helping out on the um, on facilitating as well. Um, okay, not a problem. At all. Anything I can do to be helpful. Yeah, I'm almost curious. Um, as Shelley commented earlier, the three of us. I'm going to turn my video off again. Sorry. Um, my husband didn't work Monday and my internet worked so much. He's back to work. Uh, it's pulling on it. But through just the th even having the chance to have now multiple conversations with you, uh, I would love to see the college associations of the 20 plus people because you had a great crowd. I mean, breaking it up into two calls. It would be so, because sometimes I think uh, everyone expects the humanities people to to lean on kindness. No, you know what I mean? Like some of the stereotypes uh -huh. like that, the pressure to cover content or you can't go on in physics without X, Y, or Z. Um, so it feels like a real moment of camaraderie and commitment to some of the humanizing elements. So in some ways it's it would be awesome to see. I know they were from so many different departments um, and colleges. So the funny thing well, the was, funny thing was that, that, that actually a lot of us was, and I think that was a bit of the, uh, because in part because it was Sean and my name were on it, uh, there were a lot of um, College of Science people, which actually doesn't matter anymore because, you know, it's going to be the College of Arts and Science. And if anything, that's going to be the thing that we should get out of this right finally we have a um even with it finally we're going to be in a college where i can uh, discuss with shelly and with melanie for instance and you know have a talk about uh, all the big intro classes and what we can do there and sit in some classes and see what kind of revolutionary techniques you guys are using and vice versa um i don't think that everything that's um how you're teaching a history class should necessarily apply to a physics class and vice versa. Um, I, uh, for very many reasons, I think, yeah, kindness type of approaches would show up more often in the humanities, the word says it, than in, 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 in the hard sciences. The word tries to say that too. Um, so yeah, not everything applies, but let's have the discussion, right? Let's keep talking. And yes, convenience schedules, physical buildings, those are hard, but, um, okay. Um, it's always going to be harder to the odds of me meeting um, um, somebody in chemistry randomly are a lot higher than me meeting Molly because I don't even know in what building she's normally working. But, you know, um, uh, with chemistry, I don't share a printer either. So there are not that many random conversations either. But uh, at least now, and especially through all this, at least I know your faces. So there's at least a random thought. Uh, you know, if, if we happen to meet each other um, just before or after class, if you're, you know, in the main classroom hallways, we can at least more easily have those quick discussions. Hey, how's it going? Have a, it's more inviting. It's pro hopefully more easy to have a, um, Zoom conversation, um, some kind of group 
if we know each other a little bit better. So yeah, I don't know. That's great. Is there anything you think you need to help with that mid off and that the collaborative can help do to set up or to be successful? Um, so any, any, any questions, um, any opinions about uh, the questions that I just had on my PowerPoint slide? Um, and and what you know, what else would you should we discuss at that meeting? I mean, any, any kind of feedback there is great. I'm planning to send out a doodle poll one of these days, maybe even today. And um, yeah, anybody who wants, still wants to join um, is more than welcome to join. I think. Yeah, uh, I, I hope my hope is that we can keep it up, keep it with 20 plus people, then, then we have a nice, um, nice crowd. Um, and then any kind of um, results that come out of that, we can easily hopefully also bring back to, let's say, Joanne or to the provost office and say, hey, this is these are our this is our thinking as a sizable portion of campus. Think about that. Um, and um, yeah, so keep advertising and keep supporting. Thanks for the support so far. Absolutely, yes, we can. As soon as I would let the current group drive the dates based on their existing yep. commitment, but then advertise it to any new people. Yep, that sounds good. Um, I mean, there are a lot of new faculty coming up, uh, coming on, coming to campus, right? Uh, so um, maybe specifically targets those people, and I'm thinking of that now. Yeah, I just put in the chat that yeah. there's always the orientation. So oh, yeah. what if we normalize? We put it in there as an opportunity uh, to join. You know, one of. Yep. Yep, that, that, that's, that sounds actually like a good idea also for um, new, faculty, new faculty to start developing a network of people. And then on a real um, technical note, I want to make sure the one slide that relates to the awareness list, the slide of what we, like the institutional support things. Yep. Uh, I would love to double check that if they are not on the awareness list that they are reflected yep. there. Yep, uh, I'll send you uh, the presentation. Oh, that's great. Any final comments or questions? Cool. All right, well, I would like to, if you can hear me, a round of applause to Tice and all the participants in the post-pandemic or almost post-pandemic, approaching post-pandemic teaching. Uh, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Yota, Kappa, Lopta. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And um, please, this will be in the resource referatory. So thank you to all who are watching um, the recording. Uh, thanks for joining us on day three of the Summer Sandbox.